I'm from Barcelona. I am an industrial engineer. And right now, I am a product owner at MeteorSim. And since this is not enough work, it seems, I'm also pursuing a PhD on the site about renewable energies. And fun fact, this picture was taken in Vancouver last year, which I visited after my first Airflow Summit. So what do we do in MeteorSim? Well, we offer weather and air quality services. We work in many lines of work, but in the environment line, we work in these particular sectors, mainly in chemical industries, mining, and oil and gas companies. So we offer many services, but one of them is a platform, a web page that allows our customers plan their operations, minimizing the environmental impact. They can also react to pollution complaints or events that could come from citizens, that could come from the public administration, etc. So since we are from these weather and air quality services, we run computationally expensive simulations. In particular, we have basically one pipeline, which has four basic steps. So we have the data acquisition step, where we have to download global models, we have to download emission data, process data, observations, etc. We then have to pre-process all this data so that our models can understand it. We then run the simulation. So for meteorology, we use WARF. For uh, air quality, we use uh, CalPath or high split and other open source and standard models. This simulation part takes a lot of resources. So we could say that, for example, if we wanted to simulate all of California, so we wanted to create a weather forecast for the next three days in California, it could take up to 24 hours easily. Once we have the simulation done, it's when we go to the post-processing. This is normally a cheap and easy part. Uh, it still might take up to half an hour. And it's where we create the intelligence that our customers need. So in order to run this pipeline, uh, what we use is a bare metal machine on premise. It's an HPC. And then we also have some virtual machines on the cloud that help us run further simulations when the area or the region we have to simulate is huge. The bare metal machine on-prem and the virtual machines are all managed by Slurm. Slurm is an open source software and is actually the standard in, com in scientific uh, computing. Basically, if you go to any supercomputing uh, center, you will see that it uses a Slurm. A Slurm does a great job at allocating resources. So if imagine an airflow task or a job, whatever, you, j you can tell a Slurm, this job, is of high priority, needs this much memory, this many nodes, this many CPUs. And a Slurm will help you parallelize this job in all of your cluster and make sure it runs on time. So although a Slurm does a very good job at allocating resources, it does not orchestrate. So before Airflow, we basically had a huge front up file. It was thousands of lines long, it was a nightmare to manage, we had some rudimentary monitoring service, like an internal web page and email messages, but it was difficult. And if you hadn't built a pipeline that was failing and you had to fix the job, yeah, you probably spend the whole day just working on that. Also, something very interesting is this point. So it was impossible to relaunch job at the step that failed. So imagine you have just finished the 24-hour simulation and the post-processing failed. Well, then you were in a bad light because you had to rerun the whole simulation. You could not restart the pipeline. So that's why we decided that we had to go into Airflow. And in 2021, we started the adoption of Airflow. However, we wanted to still use Slurm. So we had to find a way to manage or to make Slurm and Airflow speak together. So this is an overview of the, of the integration we have created. On the left side, we have our computing resources. In this case, we have the two master nodes of our HPCs. One is active, the other one is passive. And in each master node, we have two daemons. One daemon is used to launch the jobs on a Slurm, and the other one is used to monitor them on a Slurm. 
On the right side, we have, uh, in this case, two virtual machines where we have the three airflow services installed. Uh, we have two virtual machines so that we have redundancy, high availability, and everything always works uh, very well. So in the trigger and the scheduler of the virtual machines, we have the Slurm operator and the Slurm trigger, something that we developed for this integration. And how do these two components speak with the demons we have on the HPC? Well, we use Redis. In this case, we use Redis objects and Redis lists. This is an example of the message that gets written into Redis. So the information you have is basically in which cluster you want to run that job, so on-prem or the cloud, the common that will run on Slurm, so that will be the path to the script that will run using Slurm. Then we have some options for Slurm for resources, in this case nodes and CPUs. We also have the environmental variables needed, in this case, we also have resources for the Slurm, but you could have also environmental variables that your job needs to run, for example, the model version or where the config file is located at. Then on this message, the two daemons also work on it. So the daemon that submits the job in the Slurm will add the third object, the result object, and it will store the job ID, the Slurm job ID. So you can actually monitor what's going on with that. And finally, the daemon that really monitors the job adds the last object, which tells you the state in a Slurm. So is it completed? Is it running? Is it waiting for resources? What's going on with that job? From this message, you can probably figure out the workflow that we use to use a Slurm through Airflow. So we have this Slurm operator, which when, it's, when it gets instantiated, it basically parses all the DAC and task configuration and creates the message we've just seen in Redis. This message is stored under a message ID or a Redis key. This Redis key is added into a Redis list. We use lists in order to make sure that only one time that job is going to be run. If we use the PubSub model, if we have multiple demons listening to that channel, uh, the job might be submitted more than once. So once this message ID is put into the list, the first demon receives that message ID, goes to Redis, obtains the message that we've just seen, parses the information, submits it to Slurm, and Slurm returns you the job ID which then the daemon adds it on the message as we've seen. The Slurm operator during all this time is just listening into the Redis, it's just pulling the Redis message. And as soon as it sees that the daemon has added the, the Slurm job ID, it defers itself, it creates the Slurm trigger and gives the Slurm trigger the message ID. The second part of the integration consists on monitoring. So as we've seen, there is a daemon, which every five seconds gets all the running jobs in the cluster and all those that have finished in the last few minutes. And then it iterates over each one of them and updates the corresponding Redis message. This is something new that we had to introduce a few months ago, because before that we used to get the Slurm job state individually per job. However, at big times where we have hundreds of tasks running, we saw that this was a very expensive call. So that's why we have to get the state in bulk. Then we can go to the Slurm trigger, which creates a background task in order to read the Slurm job log file. So this means that Airflow, your Airflow instance, must have access to where the logs are in, uh, stored. Maybe it's a bucket, maybe it's an NFS mount point, maybe it's an elastic search instance, etc. And then there is also an infinite loop which constantly pulls the Redis message or the Redis object and checks if the state is completed or failed. If that is the case, basically it yields and the Slum operator then decides whether to fail or to complete the task correctly on Airflow. So high level, this is how the integration works. 
it's actually quite simple, but took us a, a long time to figure out how to do it, because as soon as you start implementing it, you will start seeing things that can go wrong. Now, all of our pipelines use a lot of resources, so almost all of them have to run through Slurm. So on our Airflow instance, we basically run everything with a Slurm operator, SSH operator, and external task sensor. So we decided to find a way to help our technical people manage DAGs and create DAGs in a very easy way. We didn't want to burden them with the, necess the necessity to learn a new language. So we created an internal web page, which is this one. It's a form that allows you to create automatically. So it has all the normal parameters that you would have to code in Python, for example. There is also a cluster input over there, so you can decide whether to run it on-premise or on the cloud. And once you have created the DAC, you can then create the tasks associated to that DAC in one of the three operators. So again, you would have on top of that the normal Airflow task parameters, but then you have this other form here, which is specific to each uh, operator. In this case, you have the Slurm operator where you can put the script, you can put the resources it needs, and also the environment variables. This has worked very well for us uh, since it's super easy to create new DAGs. When we have to onboard a new employee, it's trivial to make them work with Airflow. I understand that some companies need a lot of flexibility, so this wouldn't work for them, but from us, for us, since we just use free operators, it's fine. So to wrap up my presentation, and as I told at the beginning, I wanted to be, I wanted to make a very light presentation today. We are very satisfied with the integration we have developed. So now we have Slurm, which does a fantastic job on managing resources and allocating them. And then we have Airflow, which does a fantastic job orchestrating all the dependencies. We also have the ability to run jobs in any cluster that we have access to. And it's as easy as going into the web page and selecting on-prem or cloud. You don't have to do anything else. Since everything has redundancy from the HPC to the virtual machines, uh, we also use deferrable operators we have high availability. And this helps us tremendously. So right now we are on version 2.10 of Airflow because we are always updating to the latest one. Because for us, updating Airflow is just a matter of five minutes. So downtime is virtually non, uh, super easy, and we get access to new features. So for example, data sets, which were added a few months uh, ago, we have added compatibility in our web page, and we now use data sets to create dependencies between DAGs. And finally, yeah, as I was explaining, we have this web page, which has been a lifesaver for us. Yeah, we haven't wasted many hours creating it. It's a very simple web page, and everyone knows how to use it. So some of you might think or might have seen this integration as something as the remote executor or the edge executor. And that's true, it could be converted into that. However, when we started working on this integration, that AAP didn't even exist, so we couldn't make use of this technology. So next year, about April, I think it is, when Airflow 3 appears, let's hope there are no delays, Maybe we will have to work on restructuring all of our code and creating a proper integration that maybe won't need the Redis instance in the middle. So if the community is interested, then we could actually create a provider for Slurm and everyone would have access to this code and be able to run Airflow and Slurm together. So that's all for this afternoon. Thank you very much.